Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. Hey, Marina. How are you, Richard? I'm all right. I've been in India and I got back last night. I might have to rely a little bit more on vibes today and insight. But, um, it's all vibes, Richard. Everything's vibes. It's all vibes based. It's the rest is vibes. vibes. Yeah. Uh, now, we've got three things to talk about today, two, two of which you would say are normally very important. Is Elon Musk going to buy Disney? Is that his um, long game? Uh, should TikTok be banned? That's a big deal. But we're also going to talk about Greg Wallace's life in the day. And knowing the two of us, I know which of those three will spend the longest time. Oh, on. yeah. I've yeah. got a tight two days on Greg Wallace's on one Greg, day. Uh, as have I. But probably we should start with Musk. Like like, like a teenage boy's bathroom routine. <laughs> Let's start with Musk. Let's start with Musk. Elon Musk has attended a premiere of a film. And I'm going to tell you in a minute what the premiere of the film was because it's quite special. He was there with Nelson Peltz, who is an investor in Disney. He doesn't own a huge amount of Disney, but his f- investment fund earns probably less than 2%. But he's trying to make trouble for Disney. This is what you call an activist investor. He wants seats on the board. He wants to install his own people. And he's been making trouble for some time. An act- activist investor is one of the few times you can use the word activist and know you're describing a wrong one. Absolute wrong one. Yeah, activist investor Nelson Peltz. Now, at a premiere, again, we're going to come to what it was for in a minute, Elon Musk attended with Nelson Peltz. And he was probably a slight su- surprise attendee at this thing. And they said to him, what are you doing here? And he said, you know, just looking around, seeing about companies to buy. <laughs> oh, God. So it's either Disney or the cinema. And people have said, well, could he buy Disney? And I'm afraid I would have to say the answer to that question is no. Like all of these like newspaper questions to which the answer is no. Could Elon Musk buy Disney? No, he couldn't. That's not going to stop us having that as oh, our, no. our tagline oh, no. on, on this episode. no, that's 100% going to yeah. be the tagline on this yeah. episode. Will, of it'll course. Be, will Elon Musk buy Disney? In the great spirit, you know, is this the face of Christ in a piece of toast? <laughs> no. Okay, will Elon Musk buy Disney? The answer is no, he won't. First of all, it would cost him about five times what he paid for Twitter, now X. Not five times its value now, about 10 times its value now, because of course he's h- halved the value of Twitter. So I think that would probably what, be one you know, of the questions that the board would, and the shareholders indeed would ask, have you bought any companies recently? If so, how's <laughs> it going? How's it going? And he would have to say, well, I mean, I've had a little bit of trouble with this thing I bought, you know, last year or whenever it was. I, as an absolute sidebar, you know, when everyone, you know, lots of people left uh, Twitter and they said, no, I'm not, I refuse to make money for Elon Musk. You think, no, you're losing him money. That's why I stuck around. <laughs> every every day I'm there, I'm costing him an absolute fortune. Yes, uh, yes, I this I agree with. Okay, so he, now I'm going to tell you what, what the movie that they're attending was, because Nelson Peltz has another job other than activist investor and general all round wrong and, He's the father-in-law of Brooklyn Beckham. And the movie premiere in question was Lola, written, directed by and starring Nicola Peltz, Brooklyn Beckham's wife. Obviously putting herself into the tradition of the great auteurs there, writing, directing, starring Orson Welles. So, yes, this was the premiere of this film. The film is called Lola, in which Nicola plays a poor person, just trying to make ends meet for her little brother. A stripper, obviously. Her little brother is a stripper. Yeah, no, the little brother isn't the stripper. Okay, yeah, she's the stripper. She is the stripper. And I gotcha. uh, yeah, she's just, anyway, there's obviously been some criticism that she's on some kind of poverty safari. I don't think we really want to get into that. Anyway, the premiere was attended by not a huge number of celebrities, but one of them was Elon Musk. And something else that Elon Musk has been doing to rile Disney is that he has said, I'm going to back. Because obviously various people have lost their jobs for things they post on Twitter, famous and non-famous. X, we have to call it now. Okay, so we don't have to. We don't have we to. Just call it do what we like. Let's just call it Twitter. Uh, let's just, that's what. Because also it's it confusing anyway. every time someone says X because formerly known as yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. We're just calling it Twitter now, and they'll have to write in if they're upset about it. Can you imagine if I don't imagine they would? Would they? <laughs> Please write in, and we'll read your full letter out. Um, <laughs> and anyway, so Musk had said, "I will back lawsuits for people against their former employees if they've been sat for things they've said on the platform." He's actually make, making good on this. There was a person called Gina Carano. She was in The Mandalorian, which is obviously a Disney property. It's a Star Wars property, but that all comes under the umbrella of Disney. And she said a number of incredibly imbecilic and offensive things on Twitter, I, one of which was being a Republican nowadays is like being Jewish in the Second World War. No, Gina, no, it's not. Uh, anyway, and Disney had enough of it and sacked her. And Musk has actually come good and he is funding her lawsuit. The legal documents are hilarious for this particular lawsuit because they contain... I'm going to quote one line from this. 
Carano was terminated from her role as swiftly as her character's peaceful home planet of Alderaan had been destroyed by the Death Star. Wow. That's an illegal document. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. Her career was choked as ruthlessly as Darth Vader choked Grand Moff Tarkin. I mean, no. <laughs> that's not in the legal document. Your Honour. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got to think of some more. But in some ways, all these lawsuits just seem like another sort of mask version of ship posting. Just like the, he's the world's most expensive sort of ship poster. He yeah. has the soul of a poster, which is why he wanted to buy the platform. And he does these things. He can't really make any particular trouble with these things. In terms of what Nelson Peltz can do, that has been treated slightly more seriously because Disney have had problems over the last few years. If you look at what's happening, their parks and cruises, by the way, are performing brilliantly. But you need the sort of content funnel into the parks and cruises because you can't have a Disney cruise without good... We should have called this podcast the content funnel. <laughs> the content funnel. funnel, yeah. It's like a foie gras thing. Just, we're just going <laughs> to put content down, whether or not you want it or not. Anyhow, um, Disney have been having problems. They got late into streaming. They've sort of caught up and it is working better now. But all of these big, big brands that they own have all sort of faltered, you know, where they've got Lucasfilm. Owned by Matt Lucas, <clears> of course. Owned by Matt Lucas. They've got Marvel, Pixar, and they've got all the sort of Disney legacy catalogue and ideally, hopefully, new Disney creative projects that, that can come out of um, that particular sort of silo in their business. And all of those have faltered and they've had outright flops and disappointing things and things that seemed like absolute surefire bankers, say, five years ago, just haven't been. Although nobody, by the way, in the industry believes that Nelson Peltz is the answer to any of this. He's also being backed by a guy called Ike Perlmutter, who's the former, like, absolute kind of irascible, genuinely, he is a wrong one, a person who <laughs> used to own Marvel. Now we get sued, but yeah, the I good know, news sorry. is, yeah, but if we do get sued, you know what's going to happen. I don't think they know what it, wrong one means in America. But listen... <laughs> Elon Musk will come and, Elon uh, Musk will come and yeah, help us. He'll just say that's free yeah. speech, man. Yeah. That's free speech. Yeah. And uh, suddenly we'll be, uh, we'll be up in his, court funded yeah. by him. It'll probably be selectively selective. His I think it's it. safe to say that Perlmutter and Nelson Peltz are very focused business people. Yeah, they're very focused business people. And there's a big meeting. I think it's uh, April the 3rd that the big sort of shareholder meeting is going to happen. And Disney had a quarterly earnings call last week where they actually look like now they've done enough to head off not that they would necessarily ever in danger from this particular sort of sally by uh nelson peltz but it could have built it's their best quarter for a long long time yeah. for disney yeah. and they've got some exciting sort of things coming up they're going to release a new moana movie no uh, way yes okay you, don't laugh about moana let I'm me tell not. you something it's huge it's it's so massive when um netflix had the sort of Disney properties before there was Disney Plus and Netflix showed Disney properties on their platform. More people watch Moana than Avengers Endgame. Okay. Yeah, I bet. Moana <laughs> and, and Encanto. It is, yeah. But Encanto yeah. is huge. Yeah. Encanto is absolutely huge. And they've, what else have they got coming out? They've got Mufasa, which is a Lion King thing. Again, people may not have talked about the last Lion King live action thing, but it grossed 1.6 billion or more, maybe 1.7. Okay, it's bigger than Barbie. It's but it, you may not have found it sort of like it. Maybe it didn't dominate the discourse in the same way. But perhaps most interestingly, and something we'll end up looking at more, not today because we won't have time. Because we've got, we got to talk about Craig Wallace. We've got to talk about Craig Wallace, which is a much more significant global thing. Is that they're doing a joint venture, a, a standalone sort of sports streaming. Um, mm. platform with Warner Discovery and Fox. So Disney's sports business, by the way, is ESPN. So that potentially, if it's able to launch and it doesn't get fouled up in sort of antitrust monopoly kind of stuff, will be really interesting to see whether they can make that work. Yeah, um, it's, it's impossible to overestimate how big sports are in the US. I mean, they absolutely dominate. And the Super Bowl was this weekend, of course, but the NFL and the sports are enormous business in America. That's a potential game changer. But Nelson Peltz, who I always, whenever I hear his name, I think of Nelson Muntz. Yes. Uh, on the, the Simpsons. Simpsons Listen, yeah. That's not his fault, but I do. <laughs> he, as you say, is, he's desperately trying to take control of the board at Disney. That earnings call that they had last week, and as you say, he doesn't have a huge amount of Disney stock, but he's got enough. That earnings call made him half a billion dollars just in that call because the price went up. And yet he's still furious. He's still he was, cross. He's still saying, same old story. You can't but, please a rich guy. Same old story. You made half a billion pound in one day. He's like, yeah. a, it's like Bradley Walsh or something. Yeah. But the answer to the question, is Elon Musk going to buy Disney? It feels like that's, even for him, that's impossible. So he's going to talk a lot about buying Disney. And that narrative may come you know, more and more into the fore. But we're saying now, 
Marina Hyde has given you the guarantee, <laughs> the rest is entertainment guarantee, the content funnel guarantee that Musk is not going to buy Disney. As a side note to the story about Gina Carano, who's suing for sort of damages, she also says if she wins the lawsuit, that they have to put her back in the show. I love she, that. I mean, can you imagine walking on a Monday morning and the writers going, yeah, we've got a couple of ideas for your character. Yeah, yeah, we've got it. <laughs> well, listen, we'll, we'll be FedExing the pages over this evening. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing soap opera, that. And I love that it brings in everyone from Elon Musk to Nelson Peltz to Trump to the Beckhams. I mean, it's a, it's a whole big sort of... I slightly like that you can't, and no matter how rich you are in the world, there are just some social engagements that you really can't get out of. It's like, she's got a movie premiere. She's yeah. written, she's directed, and she's done it. <laughs> Okay, okay, I will be there. Yeah, and the after yeah, party. I'm yeah, I'll yeah. be there. I'll be there. Yes. What did I think of it? Um, I thought it was really interesting. Still processing it. Yeah. I'm still processing it. Still, I think. Uh, but uh, I mean, yeah. Listen, she's done it again, Nelson. She has done it again. <laughs> By the way, on a on a on a side note to that. Side note, the, to the side note. The side note. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, in yeah. fact, I've gone all the way around the side, and now we're back where we started. <laughs> the Beckhams were on an advert during the Super Bowl for Uber Eats which is where Brooklyn Beckham's little pop-up pop came. Pop-up, which, of course, I dined at. I yeah. dined at home, but I ordered it in. But that explains a few that things. That explains a lot of things about how Brooklyn Beckham got his Uber Eats pop-up. Yeah, listen, that's show business, isn't was, it? That is show business. Um, so, yes, I think we've done a full meandering tour around that particular subject, but we'll come back to Disney and particularly that sports bundling thing because it's quite interesting, even if it might sound boring at first day. It's going to be crazy. Um, we'll probably come back to Elon Musk at some point as well. Oh, I feel think, we will. At some point. I'll but... tell you what, if the fortunes of his platform could not be completely restored, but if he can get Donald Trump back onto his platform in an election year, that will that will make things very different for that particular business. But we'll have to wait and see whether he can. Should we move on from Elon Musk Let's. to Greg Wallace? Greg Wallace. Now, Greg with two Gs. He Greg Wallace with two L's. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> traditional. Sort of uh, not this weekend, but last weekend. Greg did the equivalent of one of those Sunday Times lives in the day. It wasn't. It was my Saturday, and I think it was in the Telegraph Saturday magazine. And his day caused a certain amount of merriment among the wider social media community. And in fact, it seems to have caught fire. It seemed to be trending on all platforms for days and days. Uh, let's just take a look at what his day involved. Saturday routine, he was up at five checking the numbers for his health program. Before we go into this, because I don't want anyone to think this is going to be 20 minutes of mocking Greg Wallace. Because it's I, not. Because it's really not. I, I've got a number of reasons why I quite like Greg Wallace, which we'll get onto as we go through his day, I think. Um, I think getting up at five o'clock in the morning, that's okay if you want to get up at five in the morning, wouldn't do it myself. But I, think I get it, up at five every morning. No, you don't. Yes, I do. do if you not really? before, yes. Is there a time before five? There is, I'm afraid. And before five is not my choice, but I've been yeah. quite busy this last year and so I have got up. So your schedule, early. very much like Greg Wallace. Greg Wallace. I'm much like Greg Wallace. Up at five. I don't go to the gym, which staff open an hour earlier just for Greg, just so he can have a swim and sauna. I don't do that at, at five. So I don't he, think he does that at five, actually. I think he does that a bit later like on. Like 7.30 or something, isn't it? Yeah, he says he says that the um, the gym opens for him. And again, listen. Don't knock it. If they yeah. could do it for me, I would have it. But Yeah, and that's the thing. Everyone, if... If they say, I mean, honestly, it'd be easier for me if it was 7.30. Uh, and, you know, David Lloyd himself comes down and says, oh, God, come on then, Greg. <laughs> Let me roll out the red yeah, carpet. of course, well, at least he's going to the gym. We really got into the territory of Partridge when he divulged that he has breakfast at a harvester with his PA. Yeah, I mean, that is that is That's unfortunately hot. Partridge. But at the same time, listen, Greg says that the harvester's never let me down. And I, I have to agree with him. He's going to have a PA. That's OK. Yeah. Elon Musk has got a PA. Greg's a busy guy, and he likes to have a breakfast at Harvester. I think, listen, he's gone to the gym, then he's bought himself a fried breakfast at Harvester. Thus far, I'm very comfortably on board with Greg Wallace's day. He, yeah, I mean, he plays with his son for a bit, then he spends two hours locked in his study playing Total War Saga, Thrones of Britannia. Again, I mean, can I just say something about this, which I think you're probably going to end up agreeing with, Richard, is that don't we want our celebrities to be like this? I can tell you, my least favourite thing ever to read in these like celebrity life in the day things is when they say, then I'll have lunch or dinner, which will be steamed fish and, mm. and vegetables. If any celebrity mentions steamed fish and vegetables, I just want to shoot them. I mean, yeah. don't, please don't think that your diet, your nutrition yeah. passes for conversation. It does if it's a harvester. Then yes. it's a conversation then it's topic. interesting. It does not if it's steamed fish. No celebrity should ever use those words again. All we want is the people who do these profiles 
to kind of be crazy and ridiculous. Sometimes yeah. they do very funny ones. Tom Hollander did an yes. absolutely hilarious one in the Sunday Times where he said things like, in, in the afternoon, I might go for a walk along the canal or masturbate. And it, just, it was, everything was hilarious. Orlando Bloom did an absolutely classic one where he said, I like to earn my breakfast, so I'll just have some green powders that I mix with brain octane oil, a collagen powder for my hair and nails, and some protein. But wait. So, sorry, did he have the word just in that, uh, in that yeah, sentence? Yeah, yeah, he does. Wow. And then my, the, my other favourite thing that he did is that he said, like, constantly think about roles that I need to, to, to advance people, myself, women and minorities. <laughs> the three big ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I mean, this is what we want celebrities to say. Do you remember Mark Wahlberg's routine? Yeah, his was crazy. This was at, his was. He gets up at two thirty a.m., wakes up, Come then on, he Mark. has prayer what, time. What, I mean, what is he a fishmonger? Yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> He he. Then he has prayer time. Then there was breakfast. Then there was workout. Then there was another. he had so many workouts, and there was tiny bits of family times that were scheduled into all of this. But what seems so odd to me is that first of all, quite gutting because this used to be the guy that was inspiration for Entourage. Greg Wallace. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg. Okay, I'm with you. <laughs> Sorry, I mean I know you. Yeah, yeah. And then, and you thought this is so d depressing. I mean, is this what sort of modern acting of a certain mm. type is? The bit where you're actually pretending to be someone is a tiny, tiny bit of the day, and mostly it's this insane workout schedule. Also, you can star in like Daddy's Home too with Mel Gibson, and it seems very odd to me that so much of well, in fact, male and female actors. The, the day is spent on this kind of extreme conditioning. Just fitness, right? Yeah, just, I mean, it's just fitness. This is why when a new Bond film comes out, Daniel Craig's trainer would go on the interview circuit himself and explain like how many inches he'd got off the thighs or onto the thighs or whatever was necessary. Marvel are incredibly strict on what they will allow people to say about what they do in order um, to get to bulk up for these roles. Yeah. But it is absolutely grueling. The bit where you're actually acting is such a tiny part of your day, week, month, year. Almost all of it is this extreme conditioning that it's something quite different has changed for when you knew you, know, you were Humphrey Bogart and you were an yeah. actor and, you know, you just needed to go down to the coconut grove and have a few drinks and stay out till four in the morning and then go make Casablanca the next morning. This is a very different way of life now. Listen, to, to return to Greg Wallace just for a, a moment, I mean, he is he's very much our Mark Wahlberg. And our Humphrey Bogart. And our, yeah, he's like Wahlberg meets Bogart. Uh, people were so sniffy about his day i'm with you about i just, I just thought, I found it quite interesting and for lots of reasons but it's lovely that some of our celebrities are michael sheen but not everyone can be michael sheen or timothy chalamet there is room for greg wallace's in our culture and also there's a massive audience for greg wallace's in our culture you and tell me who saturday has got so much airplay ever ever yeah, before exactly it but adds it, to the gaiety of the nation and he's one of those people that people go i don't understand the appeal you think well, that's okay. You don't need to understand the appeal of anyone. But you put Greg Wallace on a TV show and loads and loads and loads and loads of people watch it. Right? Uh, he's been on House of Games, Greg. I have to say, I really, really liked him. And he's got such a great energy. Uh, the biggest compliment you can ever pay to anyone is is all the crew loved him. Makeup loved him. Wardrobe loved him. The runners loved him. He was like a ch absolutely charming to everybody, which is which is the mark of um, a celebrity. It's amazing how many celebrities still, given that most bad celebrities are psychopaths, okay, yeah. and there's a few of them, a psychopath must know that if you're horrible to someone in makeup, people hear about it, and yet they still do it. Yeah. I find that very peculiar. Anyway, perhaps Greg's a, no, he's not a psychopath. Uh, so Greg was absolutely lovely to everybody. I was watching this week Inside the Factory is one of my favourite shows of all time, of all time. I love Inside the Factory. This week they went inside, uh, Greg went inside a jelly bean factory. Oh, my God, it's amazing. You know what? They had 87 million jelly beans in their sorting room. At that one time? Yeah, at that On one the time. Premises. Yeah. No. Wow. Jelly beans are, t <laughs> listen, I digress, but jelly beans are tiny, right? Tiny little things. Do you know how long it takes from the glucose arriving to the to the final jelly bean leaving? Shock me. 11 days. Shut up. It's one of the most complicated. It was like building a jet engine, the way they were making uh, a jelly bean. And Greg is there throughout. He's moving it along. It's an open university production. And so there's lots of great educational stuff in there as well. But... He is somebody that audiences like and the audiences come to. And there's a certain group of people, commentators, who do, we've talked before about Mrs. Brown's Boys, that where, where the successful version of the thing they don't like is the thing they hate the most. Because there's loads of unsuccessful versions of Greg Wallace who doesn't, don't <laughs> exercise 
anybody. On the factory floor, yeah. scarred. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Second. Uh, and, you know, but, but Greg brings an audience to what he does. He brings an enthusiasm um, to what he does. By the way, they're replacing him on, inside the factory with Paddy McGuinness. Now, I would have liked that gig. I would have done inside the factory in a heartbeat. They, go, they show you how they make watsits and stuff. It's ri- and the machines are crazy. They're so anyway. If it doesn't work out with Paddy McGuinness, I think you've just issued a come and get me plea. Big time. <laughs> yeah. really. Os- Osman issues come and get me plea to BBC. Now he's persona non grata at Channel 4. He, he has to, uh, he, he has to go uh, to the BBC. Also, I think there's a more serious thing about Greg Singh. He talks later on about his, his son, who's non-verbal uh, autistic, uh, and everyone's having a go at him for you know, not being around his kids. And you know what? Any, you look at his other postings, and it's clear he's sort of doing a, like an edited version of his day. And he's tweeted before about his son and about his wife and all that stuff. So he's a guy living his life, being honest about what he does. And you think, oh, come on. I mean, really, in this world full of what's going on, we're going to have a go at Greg, who's a guy. I would never get. I. I. I never try and get at people about how they've how they're dealing with their children. Oh God, never yeah. mind. Because never it, mind. Because it's impossible, right? It, <laughs> to deal with your kids. Because, in the words of that character in Jeremy Guire, it is an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about. Yeah, yeah. And it, I. I really. You don't get involved in how people are running their day with their children. And honestly, half the people, well, sometimes you read the comments on Mail Online, and I honestly just feel like this is just people saying, no, sorry, mummy can't come and play. She's having wine time and just slagging off a few celebrities for how they look, you know, five hours later. I don't believe, no, I don't, I, I would never, as someone who writes about all these sorts of different things, I, I really try in general not to get involved in writing about how people deal with their children. I can't, I'm trying to think of the times I, I did mention it with a million caveats when Matt Hancock went on I'm a Celebrity because I thought the stories that came out about when he had left his wife and how it had all happened, I just thought, why would you then do this? And to, why would you then put your children... You know, it's too soon. I personally wouldn't put my children through it. But I thought very hard about how I would how I would write it and say it. Whenever writing anything about children, you don't know. You don't know anyone else's life and or what their parenting's like at all. And as I say, quite a lot of people spent the day commenting on it instead of playing mm. with their own children. So yeah, That's true. So I will say about that piece, it's, as I say, I think, Saturday Telegraph. It's really worth a read. It is, and Greg will be the first to admit, it's kind of, it is funny. God, I mean, and he must if know we did our own Saturdays, I'd be horrified. Yeah. yeah. It's it's great. And he is, he's a spicy flavour, Greg. But, you know, from my dealings with him, he's a fundamentally very, very nice man. And, he's sung for and his it, supper. This is crucial. Yeah, exactly. And also, he's so good at mentioning all of his offshoots. I think he gets up at 5am, checks the subscriber numbers to his health app. And he's literally, he's got his health up within the first three... Do you do that? Do you three... hit your promotional marks? Yeah, I bet you're yeah, really okay. great at that. Of course I do. Every uh, time. Yeah, my new book coming out in uh, September. I just check, you know, I just check on the numbers on, on, on Amazon. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he's, he's, he's got it down within three lines. He's got, and you know, you give up reading an article at some point, but you don't give up reading Steam after three lines. Steam fish vegetables so is the time yeah, yeah. for me to get my backpack and leave. Uh, so, yeah, Greg Wallace, uh, yeah, he took a lot of stick and uh, he, he came out fighting and, uh, and good for him. And I would really recommend the Inside the Factory one on jelly beans. It's fascinating. It really I'll is. Catch it now. Honestly, the way they polish them, you would not believe it. <laughs> OK, I think it's time for us to have a little break. I hope we're advertising Greg Wallace's health app. And jelly beans. <laughs> Welcome back to The Rest is Entertainment. We're going to talk about TikTok. There's been three or four different things, so we're going to basket them all together. The first one is the Universal Music Group, which is the, the biggest music group in the world, who are, who are, I think, talking about taking their music off TikTok. Well, what they've said is they are going to remove all of their artists from the platform. Now, if you think about TikTok... Obviously, it's the majority of videos on TikTok are soundtracked by licensed music and it comes from the record companies and the record companies have allowed this to happen for a number of reasons, chiefly because it is whether or not they like it, it is a very important way of promoting their artists. And it's also a way of getting their artists discovered, discoverability people talk about. And there are certain people like obviously someone like Taylor Swift, a universal artist who doesn't necessarily need discoverability. But then there are other people like, I'm just thinking that guy Noah Kahn, he's stick season. That all took off via TikTok. It wouldn't have happened without TikTok. Well, it's like any time you see a book you haven't heard of in the top 10 of the UK book charts, it's always come from TikTok. Well, BookTok, they call it. Which, BookTok, uh... funnily enough, 
they've got signs now, which someone sent us a picture of, in bookstores saying, TikTok made me buy it. Oh, yeah. it's uh, Listen, I think maybe we'll do book talk in more, in yeah, more we'll detail do... another time because it's genuinely fascinating and incredibly um, positive as well. Yes. But, uh, listen, Okay, back to, no back to Universal. So a back couple of negativity. weeks ago, Universal, they released an extremely ex- ad- aggressive statement saying basically TikTok had tried to bully them, that they've, they've been in a sort of negotiation for how much their artists get paid for the music that are used on those um, videos. And they've now pulled away from it completely. And they've said TikTok tried to bully us after a sort of 30-day grace period, which we're now right in the middle of it. Every single piece of, not just of their artists, but anything they have, even partial control over partial publication, anything, all of it's going, which is by some estimates, 50% of music on the platform. That's how big Universal are. They have absolutely everybody. They've got Taylor. Well, they don't have absolutely. That's ridiculous. Of course, they don't have everybody. But they have. <laughs> they don't, they you have, know what? They don't have me. <laughs> they don't have you. They've got Taylor Swift. They've got Drake. They've got Adele. They've got Harry Styles. They've got Ariana Grande. There's Olivia Rodrigo. Obviously, tons of legacy artists. The Beatles, Elton John. Heard of them. Dylan, yep. Coldplay, U2. I mean, they are by far the biggest fish. So what they do does matter. Obviously, if you're someone like Taylor Swift, you, as I said, you don't really mind about this. But even if you're as big as Ariana Grande, who's got new music coming out, are you thrilled that you can't promote it? On t- she, they, she's she been very vocal about sort of artist rights, Ariana Grande, and people getting paid enough for streaming and things like that. So she's going to, I expect, suck it up. But it's the smaller artists who might think, well, hang on, how am I going to get myself heard? How, am I go- how, how can I become like Noah Khan and take off in these different ways? At the moment, everyone's sort of united and they haven't even pulled the music yet. But it's a really, really big move. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating one. And it comes from TikTok being so insanely profitable. And, you know, part of the reason it's insanely profitable is you can use commercial music without paying for it. So that's a huge deal. And so at some point, if you're running any sort of company, you've got to say, well, OK, I'm sort of helping you be insanely profitable. So maybe I should have a piece of that money. But TikTok did say, oh, it's such a shame for Universal that they're, they're turning down this, you know, incredible opportunity to sort of, you know, uh, showcase their artists. And that's absolutely like that thing on Twitter when people always say, can someone make me a poster? And someone say, well, what are you paying? So, oh, no, but it's, it's just to, you know, give you a publicity. And people stopped sort of believing that thing, I think, a while ago. And the idea that you can break new artists through TikTok, it's the same as books, actually, this book, book talk thing. Five or six times a year, a huge book comes out because of TikTok. But you cannot plan for which book that is. Yeah. In the same way, you cannot plan for which of your artists it is. So, you know, if there's a thousand artists all going, but maybe maybe it could be me, it's only going to be two of them. Uh, and so I think that if a platform is incredibly successful and making a huge amount of money, and part of that is on the back of other people's creativity, and it is, you know, TikTok's great because you do you do hear this music. You're not having to listen to sort of library music. Um I think at some point you've got to share the money out, but no one ever wants to share the money out, do they, until they're absolutely forced to. And universally, the only people who could force them into doing that, I suspect. Which music is basically dominated by the three companies, um, Universal, Warner and Sony. And and we're interested to see what the other two do, because they've had to have separate, they're not allowed to negotiate altogether with these companies, they have to negotiate separately. But in terms of precedent, Taylor Swift obviously removed all her music from Spotify when she felt... uh, uh, back then in 2014 I think it was that she wasn't getting a fair deal and the artists in general weren't getting a fair deal off Spotify and she didn't go back for years so I think the the level of aggression in Universal's statement which was quite it's quite an unusual statement to read it feels unlikely that unless they get some big concessions and also what they also are asking for is sort of more protections on AI but if they if they cave before the end of this 30 day sort of grace period it, it will i think it won't be them caving it will probably be tiktok otherwise i think you'll have to see, you'll see the music coming off i would have thought so because you know the, the spotify thing is interesting because, because actually spotify pay an awful lot of money for the rights to their music but they pay it to the record companies and the record companies they're sort of a filter down and then they disperse to, it to which it goes it, to the artists yeah and so the record companies are actually making an absolute killing out of Spotify. I mean, it's beautiful for them because they're not having to, you know, there's no record pressing plants. There's none of that kind of stuff. So, you know, Universal wants TikTok to be the same thing. Whether artists will ever see any of that money is is debatable. Um, But yeah, for for the record companies, for a few years, what was happening um, with music catalogs was bad for them. They held firm, got an extremely good deal. 
are making so much money and you know they'll do the same with TikTok. We have the question of you know whether that goes to the artist, and that's a, that's that's a harder one. But yeah, I I, I would think that uh, I think that Universal have experience of leveraging the artists they own to get uh, a good deal. You you can bet that Taylor Swift, for example, Spotify won't have had to pay any extra money. I'm guessing. Listen, I have no knowledge of the insider workings of this, but I imagine she just said to Universal, "You've got to pay me an awful lot more of the money that you are getting from Spotify," and then everybody's happy because there's no precedent set taylor's getting the money she deserves from from her um, music and universal is still making all their cash one of the slightly more interesting things about tiktok is various countries have banned it so i just got back from india it's completely banned in india uh, and if you talk to um, indian people about it they say well the thing is that you know the chinese government can sleep on every single thing you're doing every single brushstroke of your phone that's the that's the narrative in india which is not the case i mean there, there, there are ties between um the chinese government and the tiktok board in various ways but it's not it's not what they're saying in india but in, in america the republicans especially would like it to be banned and there were congressional hearings with the with, with, with the head of tiktok asking about ties to the chinese government asking about privacy uh, and he, gave very robust replies. But it, it feels like now it won't be banned because uh, on Sunday evening, Joe Biden joined TikTok, his re-election campaign joined TikTok, and he uh, did a, a TikTok. Do you call it a TikTok? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, he did a TikTok uh, from the Super Bowl. I would have thought he had some universal music on it, but he didn't. I don't know why. Uh, so he has obviously accepted TikTok into the uh, in, into the heart of American government. Nikki Haley, who's, who's, who's Trump's main, if distant, rival for the Republican um, uh, nomination, she wants it banned. A lot of the Republicans want it banned. Uh, but... It's not just Republicans. I have to say that a lot of people are very sceptical of, of the safety of it and in terms of how, how, what sort of exposure it gives and what the, the, da the data is used for. Um, and I know many people who know a lot about tech, who know, or, or also or people who know like a lot of commercial media people who just won't have it on their phone. Yeah. And they will access it in other ways, but they won't have it on their phone. And um, it, it, it's, not, it, it's not totally sort of some sort of partisan issue. I, I do think that there is... Very justified concern. It's because the Chinese version of TikTok, which is Douyin, which was the which was the original version of it, that is an immensely sanitized version of what people in America and people in the UK see on TikTok. Uh, and if you're under fourteen, you're only allowed to watch the kids' bits of it. Um, you're only allowed to have an hour a day if you're a child. Yeah, there's a curfew between ten p.m. and six a.m. It's very, very, very carefully policed in China so that, you know, they don't have a generation of children stuck to their phones. But the second, of course, it's in America or France or the UK, uh, you can do what you want. You can put whatever you want on there. And so that's this fascinating. This is the trouble with democracy. <laughs> this is the trouble with democracy. I've said it so many times. Yeah, we but, can't have proper social media control. But it's, a, it's, a, but it's an interesting cultural force that if you're the Chinese government, you're thinking, I'm not sure that TikTok is doing the West an awful lot of good. Uh, yeah, no, there is. There are theories that it's it's hmm. it's deliberately it's a sort of information weapon to make us stupid, which I think we can probably do all on our own. But you know. oh yeah, we got listen, we got plenty that can make us We're stupid. We're long and strong yeah. and stupid. Don't you worry about that. But it's a but yeah, it's an interesting one to keep an eye on. So Universal v TikTok is going to carry on. Uh, politicians versus TikTok is going to carry on. Um, but meanwhile, the the rest is entertainment is, is also on TikTok. And, and uh, then so, you better so, leave it after that. Yes, we so are on TikTok. We're carrying on as well. Yes, we welcome our, our video overlords. Uh, should we wrap up with a couple of recommendations? Please do. We talked a lot about Channel 4 uh, and their search for hits last week. There's a lovely show on Channel 4, which I wish more people would watch. It's called The Dog House. These dogs in the pound and you follow families who need a dog for various reasons. And they sort of, these dogs sort of approach them very gingerly and very gently. And then they everyone falls in love. And that's, that's a really, really cute show. Very good. I saw the mighty David Tennant in Macbeth. Not a cute show, but a brilliant version of it. I... I don't know if you can get tickets. I think it's very, very difficult, but there were lots of people queuing and some of them were being given returns when I went and it is absolutely extraordinary. I loved it. At the Donmar, that is, in London, at the Donmar Warehouse in London. Any dogs in it? No, no dogs in it. Absolutely none. Okay, I'm, I'm sort of semi-interested. As I said, it's not a cute show. I don't know if you know, know <laughs> the Beth, show. Macbeth, no. Should we do a question and answer session on Thursday? We must do a question and answer session on Thursday. Uh, please be in touch with us at therestisentertainment at gmail.com with any of your questions. We have thousands now to get through but they are all brilliant so please please write in yeah ask us about what 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 uh, our regular saturday is like <laughs> <laughs> and have we, have we ever been to a harvester before uh, spoiler yes i have <laughs> we'll see you on thursday bye bye